Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Palmer I'm a very grateful member of Alan. Hi, Palmer. Um, by the grace of God, fellowship, um, sponsorship, and being able to be here, I've been in this program and getting more serene since March 5th of 1990, and for that time, I'm extremely grateful. I knew a guy one time who said, you know, from by the grace of God and fellowship and all that, I haven't had to plan a murder since that day. And, and, <laughs> and I heard him say that when I was brand new in the program, and I'm thinking, my God, I wouldn't admit that. <laughs> But it's true. I want to thank some people, too. I especially want to thank the Alteens. You guys are so, you know, you're dear to my heart. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, Elaine Starr, thank you. Are you an al <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I was so tickled with, with uh, everybody in al telling uh, uh, Carolyn how to do things. So is that better? Can you hear now? Can you hear? Okay, thank you. Elaine called me two years ago, and, and I mean, that's so amazing because, uh, you know, when I first came in Allen, I couldn't make a commitment for 9 o'clock tonight because you got to be ready to go any which direction because you never know where she's going to go. And, uh, and, and here I'm, I'm able to make a commitment two years down the road and put it on my calendar and say, yeah, I'll be there. Uh, that's, that's amazing to me. And uh, Carolyn, she took over and started calling me and emailing me, making sure that I'm all set up. And, and I really appreciate that, Carolyn. And, uh, you guys have just been phenomenal. This is a phenomenal conference. And, and you know, I see a lot of conferences. And, and I'm, I, I get to see it. And, and you guys have just done an amazing job on this conference and, and all of the committee and the board. And, and I'd like to give the board another hand. You know, you, you're just great. Yeah. I gotta thank Tim. Now, now Tim is a mean host. I, I want you to know he's a mean host. I, I, I don't know why somebody from Dallas would want somebody from Miami to wear a hat like this. <laughs> so, so Tim gave this to me at dinner, and uh, and so uh, congratulations to Dallas for that one. You know? <laughs> Um, I'd also like to thank my wife, Gayla, for coming. And Gayla, stand up. We can... Now, Gayla always likes to say that she's my current wife, the incumbent, I might say. <laughs> she's not my first one, who you'll hear about later. So keep that in mind. Um, <coughs> Lee and Hannah, thank you so much for your work. Got to mention Hannah. She's my favorite taper. Lee's second. So. <laughs> um, I come to you from the Kendall Stepping Up group in Miami, Florida, and uh, I am so grateful for this. I, I, uh, you brought me home. I grew up in the Rocky Mountains, and, and it's just been phenomenal. You know, God is just amazing. And uh, The word that has come to mind for me over the weekend so far, a week so far, is sublime. This is just, I mean, we were standing up on the mountain today, and, and it's just sublime. I mean, it's incredible. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for bringing us up here and, and allowing me to be a part of this conference and, and be a part of this mountain. And, and uh, I, I ran this country when I was a little kid. Um, I got to tell you, I was up here 50 years ago, and it seems to me, I may be wrong, but it seems to me like there was more air at that time. But <laughs> <laughs> So... Well, uh, you know, I I don't know how I got to Al Anon. I, I just, uh, you know, I grew up in a family that, that uh, um, my family loved me. I was never supposed to be born, and, and I was, and, and I was welcomed. My sisters, I had two sisters. They just adored me. My parents loved me, and um, and I didn't get that message. You know, I I grew up. And I was just uncomfortable in my own skin. I could not be around you. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to act. I just, I just could not fit in my own skin. Um, you know, you guys were so smooth and, and could do everything, and I didn't know. It was as if 
the week before I was supposed to be born, I was in a meeting with God and everything, and I had to run to the bathroom. And so I came back, and God was saying, and that's everything that you need to know when you're on earth. <laughs> I, I missed the instruction set. You know, I couldn't hold a conversation with three people at the same time. I could barely hold a conversation with one. I don't have any social skills. If I say, hi, how are you, I'm out of things to say. I don't know what to say. I just, I just can't be with people. And, and um, you know, I, uh, my parents were brilliant physicists, and, and uh, I don't use that term lightly. They were in the Manhattan Project. I was born in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And, and so, you know, they were brilliant. My sister, you know, Mensa. And, and I, I came along, and I was a stupid one, you know. I, I heard my teachers say, why can't you be like her? I was just a different kid. You know, my mom said, well, Palmer's not a bad kid. He's just got character. <laughs> she said it with love. I didn't hear that. Now, you know, my teachers never said that. That's just the message that I heard. I have a disease of perception, and I hear what you say, and it's filtered through this thing up here, my thinker, and it comes a different message. And so, so I grew up, you know, I just could not could not exist with you. And, and um, I had this hole in my gut, the cold wind blowing through, and all of you probably relate to that. And, and, and it, just, it just, God, it was just uncomfortable for me growing up. Um, I waited till I was 13 to take my first drink. And uh, yeah, I'm the Al-Anon speaker, but I'm not, a, was not a teetotal in Al-Anon, you know, and I, I just got rip-roaring drunk at 13. I've heard that, you know, you have to be an alcoholic to remember your first drink. That's not my experience. I remember it. In fact, I took up baking at nine years old uh, because my sister showed me how to make a rum pie, and I got to drink rum while I was baking, and I was a happy baker, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the thing that happened for me when I took my first drink at 13, I mean, not my first drink, but my first drunk at 13, was I felt sick. I puked my guts out. And it just didn't work. I had to get up the next morning and, and I go to church hungover, feeling terrible. Now, all my friends in Alcoholics Anonymous say, Palmer, you can work through that. You just got to <laughs> you just gotta give it a little more. You know, you'll get to the promised land. <laughs> the thing is, it didn't work for me. I'm not one of that 10% of the population that has the <laughs> magic happen from that drink. It didn't happen for me. And I chased that feeling a lot, but it just didn't work. So I just stayed feeling uncomfortable. Mari said, you know, found the magic elixir of, you know, immediately feeling okay in your own skin. I just grew up, I felt I just didn't fit my skin. Um, I got out of high school and I left. You know, I just, I, I knew there's something out there that's going to fix me. So I moved from Los Alamos up to Portland, Oregon. I got in, uh, in, accepted into... Um, a small liberal arts college, the Stanford of the North Northwest. I guess I wasn't that stupid, but I didn't know it. And uh, I, I was there for a year and a half, and she moved down to Haight-Ashbury. Don't know who she was, don't remember, but she moved, and I started chasing somebody. I went to Haight-Ashbury. I had long hair and beard, and I became a flower child in Haight-Ashbury. And, uh, um, you know, but again, hate Ashbury wasn't working for me. I mean, I could and did at the time list all these things that weren't right in hate Ashbury, but the thing is that it just wasn't working for me because it doesn't matter. Wherever I go, there I am. And I was uncomfortable, alone, apart from, separate. And so I went down and uh, moved into a commune down in New Mexico. And uh, I joined this community, and I was living there. And, and, you know, a bunch of hippies, you know, I don't know if any, any old hippies in here, but we just sit around talking about love, you know, we love you and all this. And, and, and one, one evening in a moment of weakness, I, uh, I, I just, or honesty maybe, I don't know, I said, I don't feel it. I don't feel love. <laughs> And so all these people picked me up, and they had me horizontal, and they were rocking me, trying to make me feel loved. <laughs> and I was alone, apart from, less than, separate. I just, something was, in bro something was broken in me. You know, I don't know where it happened. I don't know where I caught this thing. I just, I just could not 
was not capable of feeling love and love. I don't know. Just something was broken. New Mexico wasn't working. The, the, the communion wasn't working. So we got in a Volkswagen van, flowers on the side, and drove to Virginia Beach. And then uh, we were going to study in Virginia Beach. And, and, you know, before we left, I'd gone down to my mom. She was dying in the hospital in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, I visited her from the, the commune. But this one day I said, Mom, I can't stay. I'm leaving. I've got to go. I'm going to Virginia Beach. I abandoned her, dying of cancer. You know, I was, I was selfish and self-centered, and I just could not think of another person. I just had to go, and so I left. You know, that's going to come up later in my story. But, but so we left and went to Virginia Beach, and, and after about a month, uh, the state police came and found me. And that's not a good thing when you're a bunch of hippies doing what a bunch of hippies do down on the beach. And, and, uh, but they said, call home. And I called home. My family was just coming in from the funeral. Mom had died, and I wasn't there. You know, I was off chasing my dream, chasing being selfish and self-centered, and I couldn't be there. So um, I, I went home, and I kind of uh, loaded up the house and, you know, and sold it and took care of stuff and did the best I knew how to do. I tell my story in this way. You can already tell that I'm crazy as a loon. And we haven't touched on alcoholism. I, I, I don't know if people in, in Dallas say it or, or where you go to meetings, but we hear a lot in, in Miami, my qualifier, you know, my qualifier. And it, it, I'm convinced that I am my qualifier. <laughs> you know, I marry alcoholic women because I qualify for al -Anon. I do not qualify for al -Anon because I marry alcoholic women. I'm crazy. I need, you know, I have a spiritual malady, and I've got to have the, the solution that the 12 steps bring. Well, so I, uh, I was playing music in a, in a coffee house. I was a musician and a potter, and, and, uh, and one evening she walked in. And she got my attention. And, uh, and uh, so I played two more songs and then went over and talked to her. And, and uh, we began a courtship. Lasted five minutes. We moved in that night together and then uh, <laughs> off, rode off into the sunset together. And, and uh, God and his uh, great sense of humor, you know, I'd been praying for wisdom to understand what was going on. And he delivered an alcoholic right to my door, you know. <laughs> and we began the dance. So we moved up to Oregon. I had a... Uh, uh, um, a guy was talking uh, Friday night, I mean, uh, um, Saturday, Sunday night, uh, Portland. We, we, uh, I had a home up in, uh, outside of Portland. Uh, we cut the lodge pole, set up my teepee on the side of Mount Hood, and uh, uh, lived a great time. You know, but the thing is that when I met her, all of a sudden I was okay. I experienced a sense of ease and comfort described in the doctor's opinion for the first time in my life, I was okay in my own skin when I met her. It wasn't alcohol that did it for me. It was a her that did it for me. I was okay. I played music better. My abs were flatter. I felt the power <laughs> going to my fingertips. And she was, you know, she was it. And, uh, uh, I began to chase that illusion, and, and uh, we moved to Oregon, and, and uh, you know, it was an idyllic time. It probably lasted for three weeks, uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and pretty soon the teepee wasn't working, so we moved over to eastern Oregon, and, and, uh, and my sister-in-law came up, and uh, my sister-in-law was, was, you know, a beautiful lady, and, and uh, you know, just a neat person, and she came in, dumped our, her kids on her doorstep, and moved downtown Redmond, Oregon, and began drinking herself to death. And I didn't understand. I mean, it's bewildering for the family to watch somebody drink like that. And I, I didn't understand. And then uh, one Sunday morning, she, uh, her kids were with her for the weekend, and uh, she was bleeding out of a slit wrist. I didn't understand that, that it was alcoholism, and she was dying of alcoholism. And, and, you know, I got her patched back up, put her in detox. And, uh, you know, they pump blood back in and everything. And, and uh, I had my first exposure to you. You know, there, this was a treatment center. It wasn't a treatment center. They didn't call them. There wasn't any treatment center. There was a, uh, a detox center, you know, jitter joint. And, and uh, so she was in there shaking, and I, I got to see you 
because you showed up at this at this uh, detox and we're helping her out. You know, all these funny half sentences on the wall, live and let live, easy does it, you know, and I'm going, easy does what? You know, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't understand. Nobody told me to go to Al-Anon. I mean, if it existed, this was 1974. Al-Anon was 23 years old at the time, but... I, but you know, even if somebody had said, you need to go to Al-Anon, I wouldn't have gone. She had a problem. I didn't have any problem, thank you very much, so I wouldn't have gone. But um, I got exposed to the big book. Bobby Joe gave me a big book, and I started reading it with her. And, and you know, that book is magical. It just spoke to me. And, and, I, and I love the big book. And, and so we started reading that, and, uh, um, and, I, and I got some feeling and sense of what AA was, and I just love AA. And, and, uh, and by the way, I didn't thank you for, for allowing me to be here. I, it is such an honor and a privilege to be able to um, speak at the podium of AA. You guys saved my life, and literally saved my life. And, and there's no way that I can repay that, except, you know, when, when AA asked me anything of me. You know, I was like, absolutely, I'd be glad to do that. Um, but anyway, Oregon wasn't working. We left again. Of course, you know, there's got to be something out there which is going to fix me. So we moved to eastern Oklahoma. I bought a little subsistence farm, and uh, I was going to um, drop out. Nobody told me that farming was that much work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> cows need milking at 4.30 in the morning, whether you want to sleep in or not. So, uh, you know, but uh, I stayed there for a while and tried that. And then, uh, you know, my father-in-law, neat guy, neat guy. He broke cutting horses for a living. Uh, um, and uh, trained cutting horses, and, and and I watched him, and you know, and I learned so much from him, and he just disappeared. And uh, I went down Poto, Oklahoma, and found him in a, a flop joint, just a shell of the man. And, and you know, I didn't understand. Again, it's bewildering. I had to take him to uh, a detox in McAllister, Oklahoma, and he said, "Palmer, buy me a beer." I'm going, man, I'm taking a detox. Why am I going to buy you a beer? And, and uh, But he made me understand that, that there were bugs crawling all over him, and he was seeing things that I certainly didn't see and couldn't see. And, and so I bought him a beer to get him for that 45-minute drive or an hour drive over to McAllister and put him in detox. Again, I don't understand. It's bewildering for the family. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know what was going on. Um, but I did what I had to do, and I took him over. And again, I saw you. You know, you showed up. And, and working with this guy, and, and uh, you know, um, neat thing to see. My wife started doing funny things, you know, and she started drinking a lot and doing a lot of uh, uh, extracurricular stuff that uh, we don't talk about from the podium of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and, uh, and you know, that didn't really bother me because I just do it with her. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm not a teetotal now and on. I mean, I just, uh, I jump right in and do do all of it, and then, uh, um, and and it's just um, you know it gets gets more comfortable and and you know and she got further and further and crazier and crazier and I'd try to reel her back in because if you know it was apparent to me that if I could just make her okay I could again experience that sense of ease and comfort now if you had asked me at the time I was being a kind and, and loving husband of trying to take care of her I didn't understand that I was being selfish and self-centered, that my need to make her okay was so that I would be okay because I was uncomfortable with her being out there. And so, you know, once again, really, my problem is that I'm selfish and self-centered. That's the root of my problem, and I didn't know that until I came into the program. But I got crazier and crazier trying to make her okay. And if I could just make her okay. And I, I did crazy things. Like, you know, I mean, she, it, it describes us in the chapter to wives in the big book and into, in our first Al-Anon pamphlet that was put out in 1955 at the AA International. It talks about the despairing wives and, in this case, husband. I hated that chapter. I hated that chapter when I came in. And I, the reason I would have told you I hated it was because it was sexist. Didn't. Bill Wilson know when he wrote this that there were men who lived with Alan, with women who were drunks and and uh, it was antiquated. I mean, it was written in 19, published in 19, uh, what 37, and and uh, and uh, you know the language was old. That's not why I hated it. That was what my mind said. Why the reason I hated it is because Bill Wilson looked in our window when he wrote that. He described my family, and I didn't want to face that. 
You know, the despairing husband, the affairs, the retaliatory affairs. And all of the stuff that he talks about was going on in my home, and I didn't want to face that. I didn't want to see that. I didn't want to face alcoholism because I knew that I could just do something and she would be okay. And if she was okay, she would work for me again, and I would be okay. And I became obsessed with making her okay. I became obsessed with seeing what she was doing and with whom she was doing it. And so I'd walk in, and and I know I saw a bunch of Al-Anon standing up. There's probably some of you who were detectives. I became a detective. I could walk in and and, uh, and just look in the ashtrays and where which which ashtrays were filled and decide what was going on and and probably pretty accurately too and who had been there and all of this and and you know the need to know you've got to know. I mean, I spent lots of time doing drive-by sightings at the bar or at guys' houses and then uh, one night you know she took the truck. And she was going to the lake, a party. And I had to, I had to know. I mean, it, I came to the point where I had no defense against the first thing, you know. <laughs> I, I had to know. She had the truck, so what do I do? I jumped on my tractor. <laughs> and, and I drove up over this mountain at night with no headlights, no muffler, and down these hairpin turns to see what was going on at the lake. Now, I got up to the lake, and nobody was there. Or I, today, I don't know. I mean, I, I, maybe they heard me coming because I didn't have a muffler. I thought I was being a, I thought it was a sneaky drive-by sighting, but, but what do I know? No, I didn't see anybody there. I don't know if they were hiding in the weeds, waiting until I left so they'd come out and party, or if they'd never been there, or if they'd already left. I don't know. All I know is that that's insane behavior. And so I got back in my tractor, and I said, Oh, okay, they're, they're gone. So I went back up these hairpin turns, back over in the middle of the night with no moon, back to my farm. And, I, I, you know, it just, it's just crazy. Um, I don't know about other people, but we isolated. You know, I have this need to look good to the neighbors. And I can't admit that alcoholism, alcoholism is in my home. Because for if, if it's in my home, I don't know. Maybe I'm less of a man. I don't understand. But I know that I had to maintain this facade that we're okay. Thank you very much. And yet at the same time, when it was appropriate, I was really good at being pitiful Palmer. You know, people would say, how are you? And I'd say, I'm okay. <laughs> and I'd get sympathy and, and other stuff from doing that act. And, and you know, it's just, it's just nuts. And, and uh but we, we kept putting people away. We had fewer and fewer and fewer friends and, 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 uh, because I didn't want them to see what was going on in my home. Um, and one, one, we had one couple left, and they invited us to a movie at their house on TV. And so uh, the night came, and, and uh, she said, I don't feel very good. Why don't you go? I said, no, I'll stay with you. And she said, no, you go. I went, you know, and uh, it was an imperative. And so I, I don't know what the movie was. It was Friday the third, Fri- Friday or some, some crazy movie, and, and, you know, that I didn't want to see. All I could think about was what she was doing, with whom she was doing it, and I just I came home early. At the door, cracked open, rifle barrel sticking out at me, and she said, get the hell out. Don't you ever come back. You know, it's bewildering. I didn't understand that I was seeing alcoholism. I saw a gun, and it just terrified me. And so I turned around and left for Arkansas. And uh, she got a lawyer, and she was divorcing me. And and, uh, uh, three weeks later, I came back uh, to meet with her attorney, and she was there. And she said, Palmer, I need to talk to you. And she pulled me aside, and she said, Palmer, I don't know what was wrong with me that night. I love you, and I need you. You know, for for an hour on that, I need you is like a shot for a, a mainline shot for a junkie. You know, I was like, oh, you know, oh, well, sure. You know, I fired my lawyer on the spot and went home. <laughs> I have an adverse reaction to alcoholics and alcoholism. I mean, you know, it never occurred to me that three weeks before this woman had held a gun on me. I mean, normies, I think, would might might, might occur to them, but for me, it was like. Oh, she needs me. So I went home. <laughs> it doesn't get better. You know, it's, 
<laughs> alcoholism is a downhill slide for the family and the, and the alcoholic, you know, and it just, it, we just got worse and worse. And, and you know, I, uh, I always had one new thing that I could try. If I could just do this, maybe we'd get, she'd get better, and, and then we'd be okay, and then I'd be okay. But, you know, we tried counseling. We'd go to counseling, and, and we'd have this long list for an hour of what was wrong with me, and, and she drank because I was, and you fill in the blank. There was a raison du jour that I was doing wrong, and that's why she drank. And, uh, of course, you know, we didn't really talk much about the drinking and the drugs in the house because, you know, you don't want to admit that to a counselor, and then, uh, uh, <laughs> for God's sake, no. So, you know... Everything that was going wrong in the family was, was my fault. And I, I knew that. I accepted that. You know, and, and if I could just do this differently, it would be okay. You know, I turned myself into a pretzel trying to, you know, on, on day A, she'd say, well, you shouldn't have done this. You should have done B. And so the next day I'd do B, and she said, no, 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 that's the wrong thing. You should have done A. And, and you know, I, I just couldn't get it right. And I didn't know what to do, and it was just getting crazier and crazier. I was getting crazier and crazier, and I just decided, you know, I thought that if I could just become a teacher, I could, I, I, I could maybe come back to the farm and work and be there, and she'd be happy. Because she had said, you know, if you're just home more, I'd be happy. And, and so, well, that's easy to fix. I quit my job. <laughs> But we were broke, and I was home all the time, and that wasn't good. So, <laughs> so one more time, you know, there's always I have I have another plan. I'm going to go back to school and get my teaching certificate. And if there are any teachers in here, I know there are. I apologize up front. I was ignorant, but I thought that well, teachers only work from like 9:30 in the morning until two in the afternoon, and it's only a, you know it's an easy gig and all that. I am a teacher today. I know that was not true, but so I went to school at the University of Oklahoma. And I began this time, I would commute from the farm up to uh, Norman, Oklahoma, and uh, it's a three-hour drive. I'd come up Monday morning real early, get up about uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, drive up, start doing classes, and I'd go back Thursday or Friday. Um, I'd do Alan on brownouts on this drive. You know, I would be so obsessed with her and what she was doing, what she wasn't doing, and that I would drive for two hours and not be aware of the drive. You know, I, I was in a brownout. I didn't know. I mean, I, I, thank God I didn't kill somebody um, by my obsession of the mind as I drove. And, and you know, um, it, just, it, just, it just was getting weirder and weirder. And, and my mother-in-law came down, and she said, Palmer, is she drinking a lot? And, and I'd say, no, you know, Mom, she's not doing anything. <laughs> but, of course, you know, I mean, I've got to maintain this facade. And so uh, another time she came down and said, Palmer, she's acting really weird. Is she doing drugs or drinking? You're acting really weird. Is she, what's she doing? I mean, you know, the family acts more bizarre than does the alcoholic. And, and, and I, again, said, Mom, no, she's not drinking. And she said, Palmer, I want to tell you a story. This was my mother-in-law. She was in Al-Anon. She'd been married to my, my father-in-law who broke horses. And she said, Palmer, I want to tell you a story. There was a lady who'd lived with a bad drunk. And uh, she kept saying, what can I do to help you so you don't drink? And he said, well, you know, I believe that if you go out and dig a dozen worms and fry them up, I could eat those worms and I wouldn't have to drink anymore. And, and, uh, and of course, we'll go to any lengths, uh, you know. So she went out and, uh, and dug the worms and brought them in, breaded them, fried them, and laid them out on this platter for him and brought them to him. And he said, hmm, you eat half. <laughs> so she ate half and uh, handed him the platter. And he went and got a bottle of bourbon and began to get drunk. And, and she's going, why? Why? I mean, I... I fried the worms. I, I, I even ate half. He said, yeah, you ate the wrong half. <laughs> you know, that story just knocked me upside the head because I knew that no matter what I tried, I always ate the wrong half. I just had lack of power. I had no power to make her anything different. And I realized the futility of that, really, at that moment. I mean, that was, for, for me, the first step story is that, you know, I just cannot make this happen. Um, but 
I wasn't ready to give up yet. There were other plans. I mean, you know, God, if you're brand new, I hope you're out of plans. God, I hope you're out of plans. You know, I just, I just kept driving. And, and one, one Thursday night, we got in this brutal fight over the telephone, just brutal. And, and, uh, and you know, I just, I didn't know what to do. I had no clue. I, you know, I just didn't know what to do. And, and, and my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law, Bobby, kept saying, Palmer, you need to go to Allen on. Palmer, you need to go to the Allen on. And, and this, this Thursday night, I just gave up. I opened the telephone book, and I couldn't find Allen on, probably because I couldn't spell it at the time. I don't know. <laughs> but I found AA, and I called you. And I'm forever grateful to meetings that have Al-Anon and al and family recovery at heart. You know, it's like this conference. And then, uh, and, and there was, a, I mean, at that meeting, they had Al-Anon, Al-Dog, al Al-Cat, al uh Al-Atween, uh, NAA all met together. And, and, I, and, and I was just blubbering on the phone. I don't know what's going on. And, and, and they handed the phone to one of the gals and, and, uh, and she said, Palmer, I think we can help you. She didn't say, it's not your fault, you know, anything. She just said, I think we can help you. And I just grabbed onto that. And, and uh, that was Thursday night. I was going to the farm. Um, they only had meetings on Sunday, Monday, and Wednesday. So I went to the farm, came up Sunday, and Monday, March 5th of 1990, I walked into my first Allen on meeting. And I just... It was just magical for me. I, I, the only way I can describe it is I was home. I had come home. I was safe, and you were you were loving, and I just I was just home. And and you know the 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 uh, I didn't hear much. I heard the three C's that I didn't cause her to drink, can't cure it, can't control it. But for me, that was just magical because um, I I didn't know that I didn't cause it. I had been told for years that I caused her to drink, and that, and they said, no, she drinks because she's an alcoholic. It's a disease called alcoholism. And I didn't know anything about a disease of alcoholism. All I knew was that all of a sudden, you're telling me I didn't cause this thing to happen in my home. And, and, and what, a, what a great thing. And, and, and I heard about the disease. And, and um, I started to leave that night. And about three of these old women, and uh, I mean, you know, they're probably 10 years younger than I am today, but at that point, (laughs) they seemed old. And they grabbed me and hugged me and said, Palmer, you keep coming back. We need you. There's that we need you again. I said, oh, wow, okay. I guess I'll keep coming back. But, you know, (laughs) I'm always grateful to those gals. And and I say gals because when I came in, there were no men in Al-Anon. Now, that was my perception again. Um, because there, there were certainly men in Al-Anon, but not in the meetings I went to. And, and they had the courage to give me a hug. And when I say courage, it really was cur- courageous because I was not a pretty sight. I had scraggly hair, uh, long beard. I was stinky and smelly. And I mean, visualize from Charlie Manson, and that's <laughs> you pretty much got what I look like. Um, and, and, and yet they just, they just hug me and bring me in. And I start going to meetings all the time. And, then, uh, and I'd drive back to the farm Friday and come back up Monday, and I'd still think about her all this time. And, and you guys told me that she's an obsession. She's like a starfish over your face, Palmer. Everywhere you look, there she is. <laughs> And I remember seeing the slogan, let go and let God, and I got this brilliant idea. Uh, it wasn't from me, like, I mean, you know that. And I put it up on my speedometer so that every time I'd be in this uh, brown out and look down at my speedometer, it would shake me up, let go and let God. And for just a moment, I could breathe, just breathe, and 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 look at the scenery. And pretty soon I'd be looking at the dogwoods and I'd say, oh my God, you know, these are beautiful. Wouldn't she like these? And I'd be back in my obsession. <laughs> um, and I'd look down at the speedometer and it'd say, let go and let God. And I'd, I'd take a breath. You know, I could breathe for just that moment. And, and you know, that, that relaxing of my shoulders coming down and, and that sense, you know, it started to come more frequently and last longer and I began to get some sense of, uh, it, I didn't know what it was, but it's serenity. 
And I didn't know what serenity was. And, and I started going to these meetings, and, and we said the serenity prayer. And, and I, I, after the meeting one night, I said, I don't understand this serenity prayer thing. I mean, what is it about her that I can change, and what is it that I can't change? I don't understand. And, and they, <laughs> they gave me the ODAT, and they said, uh, well, I want you to go, back, go, go home and read all the readings on changing what you can. And, and I'd go home, and I'd read them, and I'd come back more confused. And I said, it doesn't say what part of her I can change and what part I have to leave alone. And they smiled and said, why don't you go back and read them again, come back tomorrow night and talk to us about it. And I'd go back and read. And I'm a slow learner. It took me about three weeks before it dawned on me, oh, they're talking about changing me. Oh, okay. You know, I, I'm slow. And, and so I just kept doing this thing. But, you know, I, I, I still had plans and I still had dreams and I still had a better way to go. And, and uh, about two months later, my wife hated me going to Al-Anon. I mean, she she hated it. And she said, you know, if you go to Al-Anon, there were all kinds of threats of what she would do. And I just had enough sense to hang on because I knew that you could save my life. I mean, something in these rooms I knew could save my life. And I just grabbed on and kept coming. And, and, and I, it was okay. She could go do what she needed to do because I was still going to Al-Anon. And, and, and uh, in June, I went home and... And she was standing over me with a butcher knife. And, and uh, she said, Palmer, you got to go sleep pretty soon, and you're a dead man when you do. And, and I had achieved this sense, so, so, such a sense of despair at that point that I didn't care. I just rolled over and went to sleep. And uh, I don't know what happened to her, whether she never meant it, whether she passed out. I don't know what her story is. But I know that I woke up in the morning and realized that I had achieved, I had reached the point of despair I had attempted suicide the night before. She was the instrument. Didn't happen, obviously. Um, and I just left. I left the farm. I left my son. I left my dog. I left her. I left everything. I had my truck, my guitar, a pair of jeans, extra pair of jeans, an extra shirt, and I left. And I, I didn't know where I was going. I ended up back up in Norman, Oklahoma. I was homeless. and, and But I just knew... You know, they kept telling me, when you know, you'll know. You don't have to make a decision today. And I didn't know what they were saying. When you know, you'll know what. You know, and, and um, But I just woke up that day, and I knew the relationship was done. I could not stay. I, um, I moved into a, on a couch with some friends who had just come out of a halfway house. You know, who else am I going to find? You know, a couple drunks and, uh, you know. But they were sober, and we st we began having meetings. You know, we'd go over the big book. We'd go over... Uh, uh, the Al-Anon literature, the ODAD, and uh, Courage to Change wasn't out yet. And then uh, we'd, we'd just have meetings and, and discussions and uh, all day long, and, and um, it, was, it was just remarkable. And, and, and uh, after about a week, they said, you need to call the university. They called today. And, and I said, why? Well, why would they call? I mean, they don't even know I know you. And they said, well, I don't know, but they called here. I don't know how they got the number. You know, God is just awesome. They called, and, and they said, Palmer, you need to come in and arrange your student teaching. And I said, I've got my student teaching done. I'm, I'm doing it down in Wilberton, Oklahoma. And that was three hours away. It was right by the farm. And they said, you can't do that. You've got to fill out a lot of paperwork, and you've got to make this happen, and you don't, you don't have any paperwork. I said, I did. I filled it all out. It's in my file. I said, we don't have a file on you. It disappeared. I said, but... We just happened to have a guy who called in, and he'd take you in Norman, Oklahoma, if you'd like to stay here and do your student teaching. You know, what, what are the chances? I mean, I, I couldn't go back to the farm. I, was, I, I couldn't. And so I was given the opportunity to do my student teaching in Norman, Oklahoma, and I taught at Norman High School. And, and uh, uh, I got a bachelor's degree. You know, I don't know how that happens. And, and about that time, I got a sponsor. You know, they kept harping on this thing, you need to get a sponsor, get a sponsor. I didn't know what it was. And I saw this guy come through a meeting one day, and I said, would you sponsor me? And he said, sure. And uh, he said, I want, you to do a, I want you to go home and write a gratitude. I want you to write one thing for which you're grateful. And, and you know, it's like sponsors do weird things. I'm like, oh, you want me to do what? You know, have you not been listening to me all this time? <laughs> You know, and, and I started to categorize all of my homelessness and all of this stuff. And he said, I don't care. I want you to write one thing for which you're grateful. So I went home, and I thought and thought and thought. Spent a long time, and the only thing I could come up to write down is 
I'm grateful. I only have to write one damn thing on my gratitude list. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I wrote. You know, so I, I thought, well, that's going to fix this. He won't ask any more of this. You know, we'll get on to something else. And, and I took it to him, and he said, that's great. Now I want you to write two things. You know, <laughs> jerk the rug right out from under me. And then... Uh, so I went home and wrote two things, and then three things, and then five things. And then I noticed in about two weeks that all of a sudden I was feeling grateful. Nothing in my life had changed. I still had, well, I guess I had some underwear, you know, new underwear or something, but I still was homeless, and I had a guitar and an extra pair of jeans and a shirt or two, and, and uh, really nothing in my life had changed except my attitude. <coughs> My perception of life had changed by simply taking a direction from my sponsor and doing something that I didn't think would, do, would work, would do any good, and yet I took the action. Chuck Chamberlain used to say that you can't think your way into good living. You have to live your way into good thinking. And that was my first experience with that. By doing what I was told, taking the action, my thinking changed. And I became, began to feel grateful. Um, he took me into the steps. And, and we started, you know, being powerless and not managing my own life was not a big stretch. You know, I, I, the, the worm story, yeah, absolutely, I'm powerless. And, and, you know, I'd managed myself into a state of homelessness, you know, living in my truck. And, and, and so I, that wasn't bad. And we got to the second step. And, and, uh, and, and I don't know if you, you know, that's a left-handed mission that we're insane. And, and, uh, and I said, I don't know about that. I, I don't think I'm insane. Insane. And he said, Palmer, what was that deal about the tractor? It's like, <laughs> oh yeah. And there was another thing, you know, the night she had uh, had held a gun on me, and then, you know, I had to give the gun back because she'd borrowed it from my neighbor, my other friend. <laughs> And, and how do you deliver a gun back to your friend who, and admit that she'd run you off without uh, uh, admitting alcoholism? And, and I had told him at the time, well, Jack, I think she suffers from PMS. <laughs> you know, for somehow or rather in my, my twisted mind, PMS was a higher level disorder than, than uh, you know, alcoholism. And, and my sponsor reminded me of that. And, uh, and I was like, oh, well, okay, yeah, I guess I'm insane. And, and, and I had this sense of hope every time I sat in a meeting that, that maybe, maybe there was a solution here for me. Maybe. And so, I, you know, the second step was easy. And then, he, you know, and then he took me to the third step. And it was like, you know, I've, I've been in the room long enough, and I knew it was coming. There was a God thing in the steps, and you couldn't fool me when you talked about a higher power. I knew what you were talking about. You were talking about God, and I don't do God. And I told him that. He said, no, can't do that. Don't do God. My sponsor took me into the chapter, the agnostic. And it says in there to be doomed to an alcoholic death or live life on a spiritual basis are not easy alternatives to face. It told me that I suffer from a spiritual malady that only a spiritual experience can conquer. And it told me that if you don't believe in God, don't, doesn't, no, no big deal. But well, over half of our fellowship it was like that when we came in. I mean, it's like, I didn't get this. I suffer from a spiritual malady that only a spiritual experience. But it doesn't matter if you don't believe in God. It's okay. There's another line in there. I mean, you know, I was thinking this deal doomed to an alcoholic death or, or live life on a spiritual basis. You know, I'm doing this debate. Does that alcoholic death, that knife over me, would that really hurt? You know, I mean, it's like, I didn't want to live on a spiritual basis. I didn't want to do this God thing with you. And he said, there's another line on there. So do you believe or are you willing to believe in a power greater than yourself? And I'd see you. And you guys are happy, laughing. You know, you're doing neat stuff. And, and uh, you know, some of you have gone through a lot worse than I. And you were happy. And I said, I guess I'm willing. He said, that's all you need. Come on. And we got down, down together and we said the third step prayer. The same prayer I said when I was sitting up here. Relieve me of the bondage of self. You know, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as I will. And it goes on. You know the prayer. I love that prayer today. I love that prayer. 
and things changed. You know, I didn't have to believe it would work. I just had to take the action one more time, and things happened. And, and, and we went through, you know, it says immediately we began a course of, of uh, vigorous action. I think I left that something out there. That wasn't exactly how it says, but we began a fourth step. As I was doing the fourth step, I really needed to because, you know, I had this insanity on the one hand that I caused everything in our relationship to go south, and at the same time, she, she, yeah, but she, yeah, but she. I hope that you don't have that same disease, yeah, but she. And, and I kept pointing the finger at her, and he said, Palmer, we're not doing her inventory. We're doing your inventory. Where were you at fault? And so I did this inventory, and I did it out of the big book. That's my experience. You know, I know that today Alan is doing it in a different way, but my experience is I did it out of the big book, a four-column inventory. I know it shows just three in the, in the column, but if you turn the next page, it says referring to our list again. Don't turn the page. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you look at your part, and, and, you know, I saw this list of hundreds of resentments came down to about, you know, four or five character defects in me. And, and I found that, that I had caused grave harm and, and, and damage in that relationship through my knowing best, my having to be right, my people-pleasing. I was never very successful at people-pleasing, but I was sure giving it a try, and, and I... And, you know, I, I, I didn't want to do the fifth step. I knew, I just knew that if I admitted to another human being the exact nature of my wrongs, that you guys would understand that you'd made a mistake allowing me in this door because you didn't let people as bad as me into your fellowship. And I, But I did it. I wanted what you had, and I went to him, and I did my fifth step. And, and he said, he said, that's great, Palmer, I love you. Now, you ought to see what I did. And it was like, you know, all the things that I thought were deep and, you know, that never to be revealed secrets and that I was going to take to the grave. You know, he'd done that and others, and, and it was just no big deal, and he still loved me. You know, what a magical, powerful thing. I love you, Palmer, even though what you've done. And, and so I uh, I I just kept going, and, and uh, I... Uh, did the sixth and seventh step. And, and somewhere after the seventh step, I realized something was wrong. I was in a room with about a dozen people, and something was wrong. And I went back, and I, I, I kind of stepped off the side to look at what was wrong. And what was wrong was I was experiencing a sense of ease and comfort among 12 people, and I was carrying on a conversation. I was comfortable in my own skin for the first time in my life. Somehow, while I was busy doing gratitude lists and inventories and, and, uh, and, you know, fifth steps and other stupid things that my sponsor had me do, something inside of me had been fixed. And I was all of a sudden comfortable with you. I don't know when it happened. I just became aware that it had happened. My sponsor left about that time. He graduated. I don't know where he went. I've never seen him again. I'm, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what happened. And, and I, I uh, began this uh, experiment on my own. You know, well, what happened is I decided, you know, I've been in the program about three years. I pretty well know this deal. I think I'll sponsor myself. Uh, yeah. I see some of you have tried this one. Uh, you know, but actually it's a great gig when you sponsor yourself because, you know, if, you want, if, if you're supposed to go to a meeting one night and you decide, you know, I really don't want to go to a meeting. I, I want to watch a TV show. Um, you're sponsor, you know, talk over your sponsor. Your sponsor says, yeah, that's a good idea. Go watch TV. <laughs> and, and resentments are great because, you know, I'd, go, I'd, I'd say, well, I've got this resentment against her. And, and my sponsor would say, well, you should. You earned that resentment. You know? <laughs> And I began to get crazier and crazier, and, and, uh, and I realized it, and I, I, I asked another guy to sponsor me, and, and uh, uh, I'm so grateful I did, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm an absolutely terrible sponsor for me, and, and uh, um, I, I, I heard not long ago, ISM, you know, we have ISMs, that's an acronym for I sponsor myself, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so. You know, I started back through the steps again because he wanted me to take me to the first step. And then um, we got up to 
uh, the eighth step. And, and, you know, I made this list of people I'd harmed. And, and, you know, my son was on there. I'd abandoned him. My first wife was on there because of all kinds of stuff that I had done to harm her in that relationship. And, and you know, when I wanted to say, but it was she, yeah, but she, my sponsor kept bringing me back to what had you done wrong. And then my grand sponsor, Benoit, told me one time, she said, you know, my sponsor, Pat Clayer, said, you know, why don't you keep your mouth shut and the violence would stop? And and she did, and it did. And, and I didn't know, but, but I know that every time that my first wife got angry, violent, my mouth was flopping. I was saying stuff, and I was bringing it on. And, and so I found out that I owed amends to her. And, and I made this list, as, as it says in one of our pieces of literature, you know, the, the three columns, easy amends, some you might make someday, and some you'll never, ever, ever, ever make to, you know, and of course my first wife was on that never, ever, ever, ever list. And But God's got a sense of humor, and, and uh, I made amends to her. And then, uh, uh, you know, on the side of the road, and... Um, Florida. She was down there working, and I got to to make amends and and say, you know, I know I harmed you, and I'm, uh, you know, what can I do to make it right? And and uh, and you know, I don't know whether what kind of resentment she still holds for me. I, that's not my business. I know that I'm free of that that I carried by by making that amends. And then uh, I made amends to my son. And then uh, um, you know, it was it was really neat. Six years ago. Uh, I got a call from my son. They were working in Tampa, and uh, my wife and, and I got to go over and, and uh, be there for the birth of our grandchild. And, and uh, you know, what a magical thing. And, the, and Alan put that together. Um, I, uh, I got to say, you know, I started at that time dating uh, an earth girl. She didn't understand what was going on in the program. Uh, she didn't know, understand my need for the program. Um, she was an earth person, you know, she didn't need a program. And then so we courted, and we really did. And then uh, about a year later, we got married and, and uh, went off on a honeymoon. And uh, I noticed on the honeymoon, God, she's drinking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and sure enough, you know, she started drinking a lot. And uh, I, <laughs> I was down at the Canyon Conference in Oklahoma. Uh, sitting in a golf cart with uh, my grand, my great grand sponsor Pat Clayter. Some of you may have known Pat uh, or Jack and, uh, from Austin, Texas. And and I said, Pat, I think I think I've gone and married another alcoholic. And and uh, she got this big smile. She said, Hun, sometimes I think their horns just fit the holes in our head. <laughs> And I think that's right. You know, I marry alcoholic women because I'm an Al-Anon, because I qualify for Al-Anon. And, and, and you know, I love alcoholics. And, and you know, they're fun people. And, and uh, I, I absolutely love you. And, and, uh, uh, and, and indeed, I had. And, you know, she's in the big book. It talks about women who, who go downhill in a sh- very few short years. And then my wife was blackout drinking and, and uh, couldn't get sober. And then, uh, you know, I'd go to meetings. She'd drink. I talked to my sponsor, and she drank. And, and um, I came home one day, and my dog kept taking me up the stairs, and then she wouldn't let me quit. And then uh, I went up, and the uh, door was locked. And I finally, you know, like kind of like Chuck Norris, kicked the door down. And then uh, my wife was almost dead from uh, alcohol and drug mixture. And, you know, we called the, the uh, emergency people, and they came in the ambulance and got her to the hospital, put her on a breathing machine, and then... Uh, I called my sponsor. I called you. And, you know, my people were there. My sponsor drove up from Lawton, Oklahoma. And and, uh, and and you guys were loving me and rocking me. And, and, and you know, I didn't know whether she was going to die or live, but I knew that I was loved and felt loved. I don't. I don't understand that. You know, how do you get from the guy in the commune being rocked and don't, you know, feeling separate from, apart, to the emergency room feeling loved? You know, that's something that that part of me was fixed somewhere along the line, and I was capable of feeling love. Um, I was offered, at that time I graduated, I was offered a trip to go to uh, graduate school. You know, and I thought, yeah, I can't do that. I'm the stupid one. Uh, I can't do that. I'm too old. I can't do that because, you know, fill in the blank. And then uh, I was at a conference, and I heard... Clint Hodges talk, and Clint, he said, you know, that he was offered a trip to law school, and uh, 
he uh, went to his sponsor and he said, do you know how old I'll be in five years if I go to law school? And Clancy looked at him and said, well, tell me, Clint, how old will you be in five years if you don't go to law school? <laughs> you know, I need sometimes to get slapped upside the head. They were offering me a, a, a wage and, I mean, a stipend, and we weren't going to be rich, but, but a job to, go to, to, to teach and to go to graduate school. And so I did that one day at a time. You taught me how to do that. Um, you know, you taught me how to take one test. I might remember one time calling my sponsor whining. I like to say it was quality whining, but, um, <laughs> you know, he said, uh, I, I, I said, do you, they want me to write a book to get out of here. Do you, do you, blah, blah. And he said, well, Palmer, have you written the fir first page yet? I said, well, no, but, 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 but. He said, Palmer, why don't you write the first page and then the next page? And, and so, you know, putting the tools of this program to work in my life, I did one day at a time, one test at a time, one paper at a time, one class at a time. And um, they kicked me out of the University of Oklahoma with a Ph.D. in chemistry. You know? I, I don't know how you go from under the bridge, homeless guy, to where I ended up. You can't do I can't do it. I don't have the power to make this happen. You don't go from there to here. Beth was saying that. You don't do that. Without God, without the program, without your guiding me one day at a time, you know, I could do that. Um, my wife sobered up for a year, and um, um, she... It scared her, you know, getting uh, being on a breathing machine. And then uh, um, she went to AA for a while, and then uh, she asked me to take her to AA. And I had just enough sense to, to take her to AA and, and hand her to you and uh, go to Al on me, you know, because I don't speak that language. I can't 12-step her. I can't tell her what to do or what not to do. She never asked me to sponsor her, and if she did, my sponsor would stop me in a hurry, you know. And, and so, um, but after a year, life happened. You know, life does happen to us when we come in the program. And our son went through some stuff, and she just started drinking again. The progressive nature of the disease. You know, I saw it happen. One day, she had no defense against the first drink. And she got, she got drinking. And in another two months, she was on the breathing machine, and I didn't know that she'd live or die. You know, and she could not stop drinking. I'm so amazed at the difference for me in living with alcoholism with a program, that's me having a program, and living with alcoholism without a program. I've done both. And, uh, you know, although my wife was dying of a disease, I was still doing okay. You know, not unmoved. I mean, it's, it's hard living around alcoholism, but yet I was still... Um, we, you know, it says in our opening, we can be happy whether the alcoholic is still drinking or not. And for me, that's true. I became, uh, you know, I was just engrossed in school and doing these things and, and uh, having a good time. And then, uh, you know, while she was um, doing alcoholism. And, uh, you know, and, and so I could watch that happen and, and not, not uh, you know, I could cover with a blanket as she was passed out instead of walking by and kicking her as I walked over. You know, I didn't have to do those things because of what you gave me. Um, I got a job offer, you know, in Florida uh, after I got my Ph.D. And, and, and so we went down and looked, and, and I got a job at a university in Florida. I'm on the faculty of a university. You know, go figure. I don't know. But, you know, it's always amusing to me because... One of the character defects that I prayed hard for God to remove is being a caretaker, you know, because it got me in so much trouble trying to take care of people who didn't want to be taken care of, didn't want my care. And God didn't do that. What he did was he gave me a job. All I do today is take care of God's kids. And, and you know, when in God's hands our defects become our greatest assets. You know, I'm a very effective teacher when I let God work through me and, and uh, guide my uh, you know, is to apply these principles in all my affairs. I take them to work with me. And, and so we moved to Florida, and, and uh, uh, my wife could not sober up. She found a room, and she just could not sober up. And, and uh, uh, we, we did okay, though. And then uh, I, I remember one Thanksgiving, 
she got drunk and, and started to burn dinner. And I came in and I started taking over. Our kids were down. And, and so I finished the dinner and then uh, we sat down to eat. Pretty soon she came stumbling in. And, you know, I mean, Thanksgiving dinner is not what you really want to eat after uh, a long drunk. And I had a resentment, you know. <laughs> I had to call my sponsor and then work through that and everything. And, and, and the deal is that, you know, this event that I had, a, I had a resentment over and I had to call my sponsor about was just, you know, it was just terrible. She, she burned the turkey and I was resentful. Um, she sobered up not long after that. And we were speaking together a few years ago, I don't know, four or five years ago at a, at a, uh, a meeting and, and uh, as, a, as a couple. And she was saying that she, uh, one Thanksgiving, she would got drunk and burned the turkey. And, and that had been such a shameful thing for her that she started trying, doubling her efforts to get sober. You know, it's so interesting to me that the event that I had prayed for came along and I didn't see it. It was something for me that I resented and I had to call my sponsor. I don't know what's good for me. I don't know what's bad for me. Usually when something's bad for me, it turns out to be good for me. And when I think it's good for me, it turns out to be bad for me. It turned out to be the event that I prayed for. Gail's got 12 years of sobriety now. And, and that was her bottom. I mean, go figure. A burned turkey was turned around. And <laughs> breathing, <coughs> breathing machine, not so much, you know, but turkey... <laughs> I, uh, I got to, I, I, you know, as I was doing the ninth step, of course, as must be, my mom was on there. You know, I had abandoned her dying of cancer and, and uh, run off and left and went and moved to Virginia Beach. And then, uh, again, Clint Hodges told me at a meeting about, you know, he had wrote, written a letter to his mom and gone to the grave and cleaned it up and read the letter and, and made amends to her. And, and uh, my sponsor suggested that I write a letter to mom and go back to the grave. And, and I, I, ha, I must tell you, I had contempt prior to investigation. I, <laughs> Steve, this is not going to work. I, uh, but I took the action. And I flew out to New Mexico, and I went to the, the cemetery in Los Alamos, Wahi Pine Cemetery, and I went down to the grave, and I read the letter to my mom, and I cried. And I cleaned the grave, and I sat with her for a long time. And uh, it didn't happen, but uh, I came up out of the cemetery. And the first person that I ran into was my mom's dearest friend. And she said, Palmer, what were you doing today? And I said, I was just hanging out, Becky. And she said, Palmer, what were you doing today? And I said, Becky, I was just hanging out. I went to the cemetery. And she said, Palmer, what were you doing today? Her question was just bizarre. I don't think she knew why she was asking it, but she kept drilling. And I finally said, well, Becky, I'm a member of Al-Anon, and I needed to make amends to Mom because I abandoned her when she was dying of cancer in the hospital. And Becky started laughing. Not really the response I was looking for. <laughs> She said, Palmer, I was with your mother the day that you left. And she was overjoyed that you left. She did not want you to see her dying of cancer. And she was so grateful that you had gone to Virginia Beach. God is just truly awesome. I don't know, you know, what are the odds that I'm going to come up out of the canyon taking an action I didn't believe was going to work, but doing it anyway and come out and have, be relieved of that hook of guilt that I'd carried for 30 years. And then, uh, and uh, it was removed. I have no guilt today for abandoning my mother. And it was, uh, it was just taking the actions one more time, suggested my sponsorship, whether I believe they're going to work or not. And every time I take them, it just seems to work out, and I get recovery. Um... Kayla and I have a, she, and, and now she does like to, you remember, she's not the one with a gun, but we have an incredible life today. You know, we have, we're friends. You know, she's my friend, and, and she's my program buddy. And, you know, we, we have the traditions in our house and, and, and the steps in our house. And, you know, it, it's not uncommon for us to, you know, be, rah, 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 and say, oh, excuse me, wait a minute, I, you know, this is getting serious, I need to go off. Or, I'm sorry, you know, what can I do to make it right? We make amends. And, and we keep our, our relationship stays clean. I'm so amazed that when this program 
has the capacity to heal the family. My son is in Afghanistan. Well, talk about powerless, you know, when he said he was going over to Afghanistan. But, you know, and I called my sponsor. I said a prayer about it, and pretty soon I'm okay with that, too. You know, he's serving in Afghanistan as well. And then uh, I, um, but I just got a text message from him in Afghanistan. And, you know, he, it's, this program has healed that relationship. He and I are good friends today. We were there for the birth of our granddaughter, and, and we just sent presents back to our, our granddaughter and our grandson who just had a birthday in July. You know, what are the odds that's going to happen? You know, not good. They're not going to bet a lot on it in Las Vegas. And yet this program has the power. I was speaking at a meeting not long ago, well, it was four or five years ago, and, and after I talked, this lady came up and said, you're part of the God Squad, aren't you? And I said, well, yes, I am. Thank you. <laughs> she didn't mean it as a compliment, but <laughs> I'm so grateful that you have taken me from that guy who said, no, 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 I'm not doing that God thing, to today. I absolutely know that, yes, there is a God. And yes, there is a God that loves every one of us. Um, I know today that I'm one of God's kids and that you're one of God's kids. Um, what a neat deal that is, you know. I, I, I am just, I, you know, it is truly remarkable where we go. There, you can't go from where we were. I mean, we're, we're a room full of uh, many dead people who are sitting up here listening or pretending to listen to me. And, and uh, you know... <laughs> God is just awesome. And, and, and how can I be among you and not see that? You know, Alan McGinnis, when he wrote the pamphlet or the talk, the member's eye view of uh, AA, he says that I can report that the lame do walk and, and, and the blind do see and the deaf do hear. And, and that's certainly true. Um, I was at a funeral for a father of a very dear friend of mine in Lawton, Oklahoma a few years ago. And then the, the minister talked about grace. And I went home and I, I, uh, I, had no, I realized I had no clue what grace meant. No clue. We talked about it in the program there, but for the grace of God go I. I don't know what grace means. So I looked it up in some non-conference approved literature, the Webster's Dictionary. And, <laughs> and it says, unmerited divine assistance given man for his sanctification or regeneration or and regeneration. And, I, and, you know, I understand regeneration. I've been made anew, but I didn't know what sanctification meant. And I looked it up, and it means to be set free. One of the definitions, the second or third, to be set free. And I realized that's exactly what you have done for me. I didn't do anything to earn this. I certainly don't deserve this. I've just been given a gift, and that's certainly the grace of God. I have been set free, and, you know, God in human skin, you have set me free. Thank you for my life. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.